So we'll do the same format. It'll be uh, three minutes um, and then uh, time for questions. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Chaitkin. Anton Chaitkin, I'm a historian and the history editor for Executive Intelligence Review. President Obama has put in place a reform apparatus reviving the euthanasia of Hitler Germany in 1939 that began the genocide there. The apparatus here is to deny medical care to elderly, chronically ill and poor people and thus save, as the president says, two to three trillion dollars by taking lives considered not worthy to be lived, as the Nazi doctors said. Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel and other avowed cost cutters on this panel also lead a propaganda movement for euthanasia headquartered at the Hastings Center, of which Dr. Emanuel is a fellow. They shape public opinion and the medical profession to accept a death culture such as the Washington state law passed in November to let physicians help kill patients whose medical care is now rapidly being withdrawn in the universal health disaster. Dr. Emanuel's movement for bioethics and euthanasia and this council's purpose directly continue the eugenics movement that organized Hitler's killing of patients and then other costly and supposedly unworthy people. Dr. Emanuel wrote last October 12th that a crisis, war and financial collapse would get the frightened public to accept the program. Hitler told Dr. Brandt his, in 1935 that the euthanasia program would have to wait until the war began to get the public to go along. Dr. Emanuel wrote last year that the Hippocratic Oath should be junked. Doctors should no longer just serve the needs of the patient. Uh, Hoche and Binding, the German eugenicists, exactly said the same thing to start the killing. You on the council are drawing up the procedures the, uh, to, uh, list to be used to deny care, which will kill millions if it goes ahead in the present world crash. You think, perhaps, the backing of powerful men, financiers, will shield you from accountability, but you are now in the spotlight. Disband this council and reverse the whole course of this Nazi revival now. Thank you. A quick break, I'm going to ask uh, for questions and comments. Ms. Zuckerman, if you can come up, and I'm opening it up to the panel. Yes, we're still going to, Ms. Williams, you're still going to get to talk. I'm going to ask Ms. Zuckerman to come up and join you. We're going to take a quick stop in the panel to uh, open it up for comments or questions. We have a few folks who have to uh, potentially go. The whole transcript will be available, though, and all comments will be shared with all uh, uh, council members. Uh, I apologize that I have to go uh, back to uh, an important meeting. I do want to just clarify one thing about my own, uh, since my reputation has been besmirched here, is uh, I think I do have a very long record of writing against the legalization of euthanasia. So the association of me and that seemed a little strange uh, given, I don't know, at least 30 years or 25 years of writing on the topic against the legalization. So just to clarify the record uh, for everyone in the room, thank you. Wait, can we? No. So, sir, sir, it's a, so it's not a, you, your statement was read into the record. It's not the time for debate, but we appreciate your comments. Um, uh, and we apologize for the break in the panel, but we just wanted to, uh, um, For the first 25 years of practice, I promoted water fluoridation aggressively. I thought I saw the benefits. 
It wasn't until I actually looked at the information myself and sat down and looked at the different government agencies and the different reports and the studies that I began to realize that fluoridation was a problem. One of the first things I did is I looked at my tube of toothpaste. It says drug facts. I know it's a drug. If I were to give it to you, it'd have to be a prescription. That's for swallowing. When it comes to toothpaste, it also says don't swallow. And if you do swallow, contact a poison control center. Well, the amount of fluoride that they're talking about is a pea-sized amount of fluoride. You probably don't see that in, in, in advertisements, a pea-sized amount of fluoride. Usually when I see an advertisement, it looks more like a Dairy Queen ice cream cone. That amount is a quarter milligram of fluoride. Well, that's the same amount of fluoride as what we find in eight ounces of water. Quarter milligram of fluoride, quarter milligram of fluoride, don't swallow. If you do, call the poison control center. Fluoride. Dentists say that drinking it can protect your teeth against cavities. Cities and towns all across the world actually dump it into the water supply, hoping to indiscriminately medicate the population through their tap water faucets. The official story on fluoride sounds wonderful. Drink the stuff and you won't get cavities, we're told. It's a nice story. But there's another side to this story, a side you're never told. And it starts with the astonishing but verifiable fact that nearly all the fluoride dripped into municipal water supplies isn't naturally occurring fluoride at all. In fact, it's actually a combination of hexafluorosilicic acid and sodium silicofluoride. These two chemicals are considered highly toxic by the EPA. They're actually classified as hazardous waste, and when packaged for transportation, they must be labeled as poison and handled by workers wearing industrial safety gear. So what are hexafluorosilicic acid and sodium silicofluoride, and where do they come from? That's the part of this story that you probably won't believe. That is, not until you check it out for yourself. Because the more you look into the mythology of fluoride, the more bizarre this story becomes. And this bizarre story begins at phosphate mining companies. Phosphate is an important mineral used in fertilizers. It's mined from natural rock deposits scattered across the world, and the phosphate rock is then refined to produce phosphoric acid. If that name sounds familiar, that's because it's one of the main ingredients in carbonated sodas, such as Coke and Pepsi. Phosphoric acid is often compared to battery acid, it's a highly acidic liquid that is believed to be the primary reason why drinking sodas can result in kidney stones and a loss of bone mineral density. Phosphate rock is also used to create fertilizers. The problem is phosphate is often contaminated with high levels of fluoride, as much as 40,000 parts per million or up to 4% of the raw ore. To remove the fluoride, sulfuric acid is added to a wet slurry of phosphate and water. This causes the fluoride to vaporize, creating highly toxic gaseous compounds such as hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride. These toxic fluoride chemicals used to be released directly from the smokestacks of phosphate mining operations, but the nearby farms suffered devastating losses of cattle and food crops, which withered away and died due to, guess what, fluoride poisoning. In order to stop this environmental destruction, the phosphate mining industry put in place a way to capture the toxic fluoride chemical vapors so that they wouldn't be released into the air and kill the surrounding livestock and vegetation. This was accomplished by installing wet scrubbers that captured the toxic fluoride chemicals, preventing them from being released into the environment and killing the plant and animal life living nearby. It is from these wet scrubbers that 
toxic fluoride chemicals are now harvested. They're collected, repackaged, shipped to your local city, and then dumped into the municipal water supply. So instead of these toxic fluoride chemicals being released by the phosphate mining smokestacks, they are instead captured and then released into the water supply of large cities where the chemicals then contaminate the water of millions of people at a time. This is called water fluoridation. When dentists and doctors say they support fluoride in the water supply, what they're really saying is that they support the mass poisoning of the population with a highly toxic hazardous waste product that if it weren't dripped into the water supply it would have to be disposed of as a highly toxic hazardous waste under strict EPA regulations. Curiously, it is a violation of federal law to dump hexafluorosilicic acid or sodium silico fluoride into the water. Such an act, in fact, is considered an act of terrorism. Absolutely nothing that I'm going to tell you is exaggerated, is interpolated, or is imagined. Everything I'm going to tell you is documented. And it's a great deal of it is documented on my website, which is www.healthfreedomusa, one word, healthfreedomusa.org. And so they created a trade commission. That's a very important pair of words, a trade commission called the Codex Alimentarius Commission. It is not a public health commission. It is not a consumer protection commission. It is a trade commission. Now, Codex Alimentarius Commission is administered by the World Health Organization, WHO, and the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. They fund Codex and they run it at the request of the UN. In 1994, Codex, with no notice here in this country whatsoever, declared nutrients, put on your intellectual seatbelts, declared nutrients to be toxins. They're poisons. Dangerous industrial poisons. As poisons, we have to be protected from them. What we're talking about is waking up one morning and being very surprised to find that high potency, therapeutically effective, clinically significant nutrients are now illegal in the way that heroin is illegal. Not available with a prescription, illegal. Every animal used for food on the planet, whether it has fins, feet, or feathers, every animal on the planet must be treated with subclinical antibiotics must be treated with subclinical antibiotics and must be treated with exogenous growth hormone. 